We're still in 1 Corinthians 13. Uh, we, uh, since we don't do this every week, sometimes we have a devotional. I've been away for a couple weeks. It just seems like we've been in 1 Corinthians 13 for about five years. It's not been quite that long. It just feels that long. But uh, what we're doing is we're just going through these qualities, one, one or two themes at a time, and trying to talk through them because like, they're just major areas, you know, as far as we could just read through the list, just like Glenn had read, but... Um, you know, for a lot of us, those are just kind of big major concepts that can go over our head really quickly or, you know, just kind of pass by and we never really think that seriously about them. And certainly there's times where we do talk about these different qualities that we have, but since it's in 1 Corinthians 13, uh, the idea is that we'd go through and look at them um, in more detail and, and, you know, to make sure we are loving because it's easy for us to say, well, I'm a loving person, but then when we really examine what it means to love, then uh, it's it may help us to have a good view of ourselves of where we're really at, maybe where we're strong and where we're weak, where we can grow, and maybe where we can encourage other people to grow. And so it's similar to maybe a list in Galatians chapter 5 where it talks about the fruit of the Spirit. Well, I'm a pretty spiritual person until I actually try to define what being spiritual is, and then I say, well, maybe I'm not as spiritual as I thought I was, or maybe I don't love as much as I think I do, you know. So we want to be more specific than be more general. And so today we're going to look at just the two sections. One is not, this is kind of like 5B, we would say verse 5B, is not easily angered and love keeps no record of wrong. So the first section at this point is just saying we are uh, going to look at the, the idea of not easily angered. And, and I know, you know, you can do a whole Bible study series on, you know, being in control of our emotions and our feelings and the way we treat people. And, well, there is a righteous anger, so maybe there's times we even see that Jesus got angry. Uh, we know that God gets angry, but again, that is all done, you know, in a, in a godly way as opposed to a selfish way or uh, an out-of-control way. God's never out of control that way. He never lets his emotions get too far and, you know, uh, so... What does this really mean that not easily angered? Now, we know what it is to be easily angered because most of us have at least done this once in our life, right? Where, you know, after the fact, we kind of think, well, I kind of overreacted a little bit there. And that person did something or maybe it was raising children or it's somebody at work or somebody on the freeway. Just something happens and we, you know, we get upset. And afterwards we think, boy, you know, I got, I got kind of upset about something pretty small. So my response was not even... Uh, you know, in line with the offense that was made. Does that make sense? I mean, somebody cut you off in traffic. Um, so, you know, some of you have gone to different countries, and so I'm going to harp on India like forever. Um, so here's something that's just kind of funny. Um, they honk their cars. Honk, honk, honk. All the time. And have anybody been to a country that does that before? I think they do that in South America, too. M many countries do that. So you basically drive into the intersection, and, and you you know, you're going through the intersection, although the light's red, it really doesn't mean much, but you're going to go through and the cars are going this way. And so you just kind of honk and you just kind of force your way through and people will stop. And so you're honking all the time at people. When you come up behind somebody, they're going too slow, honk, honk, you just want them to move over. But nobody gets mad. It's not, you know, don't be honking at me. It's like, mm, you know, maybe I'll honk back, honk, honk, you know, so that type of thing. So actually on the plane back, I said to Brian, I said, but you know how many accidents we saw? Zero. And I mean, we saw thousands of cars and just kind of um, so I'll give you an idea of what it looks like in India. So they have like a lot of times like a three lane highway. I'm not sure what the speed limit is. It's probably posted, but nobody cares about that either. So um, we had a driver, which we call a taxi driver, uh, that was with us for the whole week. And so he would drive us from place to place. And so he would be on this highway doing between 50 and 60 miles an hour. There's people um, in slower cars are just not going as fast. Uh, there's people on motorbikes, and I think like they go 30 max because they're only like 125 cc if you know anything about motorbikes you just don't want to go too fast on those you got people on bicycles you got people walking you've got people with ox carts all these are on this like a 696 right so you got some people at the far left on the road in ox cart. but you got people walking too because there's no there's no sidewalks but then the other thing that's kind of interesting is it's like being on 696 and instead of going all the way that way to turn around come all the way this way because there's a median in the middle you just go the wrong way down the street when everybody's coming at you at all these different varies of speeds. So just honking all the time. But nobody's mad. And no accidents. So I said to Brian, I said, man, when we get to Michigan, that's what we're going to start. We're going to start a new trend here, okay? But you know what's not going to work. I can't honk at somebody once without them being so mad. 
right? Why are you so mad? I just honked because you need to get out of the way or, you know, don't run me off the road or whatever. Um, but we get easily angered at all kinds of things. You know, so we think somebody has offended us. Maybe they didn't offend us. They're just trying to say, hey, you know, don't, don't hit me. I'm just here to let you know I'm here. So easily angered. And so maybe we've just got a lot of anger kind of built up inside of us. It's just looking for an opportunity to explode. I'm not sure all the reasons why people maybe here are easily angered than they are even in other places. So what is this idea of being easily angered? Well, the Bible speaks so much about it, uh, certainly in the book of Proverbs, we're going to spend some time there, but even in the New Testament, so it doesn't matter what uh, place you're talking about or what time you're looking at or what kinds of people, whether they be rich or poor, or whether they be God followers or, you know, pagans. I mean, a lot of people just have a problem with this idea of easily angered. It's just easy to get upset. So, you know, again, looking at Greek, it's sometimes hard to understand exactly what it means. So maybe the best way to do it is to find out how it's translated in different uh, translations of the Bible. So the NIV, we're talking about not easily angered. The English Standard Version says not irritable. So somebody who's, you know, we talk about somebody who's irritable. They're just, you know, they're just always, always upset at something. Or irritated, or the New King James or the New American Standard, not provoked, not, I guess the idea is not easily provoked, uh, you know, so again, people that, you know, you just have to do something very small and they're upset and all in a big fuss. So not easily angered is what we're looking at. So some of the verses from Proverbs 15 verse 18, a hot-tempered person stirs up conflict so that's a hot temper is just somebody who is easily loses his temper. And when he loses it, it's a big deal, right? Some people can lose their temper and they just kind of get upset a little bit and it's for a short time. But other people, again, a very small offense, sometimes like they blow up. And I mean, this tirade can last for days. It's like just, it's just way out of perspective from the offense that happened. So a hot tempered person, <laughs> they, they start conflict with everybody. I mean, they're just, even if they're not mad at you, just them being mad at somebody else all the time, it just kind of irritates you. It's just like, boy, I, that person's not fun to be around because they're always mad at somebody. So they're always stirring up conflict. But the one who is patient, kind of who has the long fuse, uh, who, who's calm, who can analyze situations better and, and act appropriately, uh, they can uh, calm a quarrel even when there is something that's maybe fairly major. They can say, how can we resolve this without, you know, yelling and screaming or throwing things or stomping out of the room or however we respond in conflict. So the idea is that we try to do better in this area of how we react in these situations. Whoever is patient has great understanding, but the one who is quick-tempered displays folly, and I think folly is kind of the polite way of saying foolish, foolishness, displays just, you know, kind of a lack of sense. Uh, you're not really thinking straight. You're not doing what is best. So um, being patient means that you have maybe a good understanding of, of, of the situation, maybe a better understanding of people, maybe a better understanding of myself. So when I have a when I have wisdom about a situation and about people in general, uh, that, that kind of shows that, that I can be patient because, you know, I realize sometimes getting upset doesn't help the situation. It seems like a lot of people get upset because that's their way of controlling. I'm going to get my own way, you know, if I create a big tirade over something that happened or a decision that's made or something that I don't like. And then so people go, oh, okay, 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 we'll do it your way because, you know, we don't want to see big babies cry. Of course, they'd get real mad at that, too. But, you know, so you, 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 they always, that's their way of controlling the situation, right? Instead of reasoning or instead of being logical, it's like, let's just get emotional. And, and they think, well, I can get my way by acting this way. And, and unfortunately, we have to make sure that we don't teach that to people, okay? So... Um, without stepping on too many toes. So take this lightly. Um, but parents or even grandparents with children, if you always go in to give in to children because they cry and they fuss all the time, then 
That's crazy. Don't do it. Okay. You see it in the grocery stores, for instance, sometimes, right? A, a, a child wants something. I want a toy or I want the chocolate or I want a piece of gum, you know, on the way out, you know. And they just throw a tirade. And so the parent gives in every time, right? So in my mind, I'm like, wow, what's that kid going to be like when he's 15? Right? Is he, is he still going to be throwing a temper tantrum in Walmart at 15? Probably. And mom and dad will be like, okay, just take the, you know, whatever you want, honey, we'll buy it for you. Because we don't want you to go upset again. Right? So giving into it really doesn't help either. But we have to have this kind of discernment and wisdom in dealing with people and even dealing with our own selves. Uh, a fool gives full vent to the rage. Okay, so I'm a little bit irritated. Well, I don't need to display it every time. I don't need to express it, either, again, verbally or with my actions. I don't need to give full vent to it. I don't need to let it just blow up. I need to learn how to deal with it. Sometimes we call that self-control. So we say, hey, you know, I'm a little bit upset. Maybe I need to calm down. Maybe, maybe even before I talk to somebody about how upset I am at what you've done and what you said, maybe I just, hey, I just need to take a break. You know, I, I, like, I'm just too upset right now to try to express it, and I, I don't want to get all upset. So maybe I'll just, you know, calm down a little bit before we get involved with uh, maybe trying to find some resolution. But, but the wise bring calm in the end. So that's kind of what we're pointing towards. That's, that's our goal, it is for peace, for reconciliation, for understanding, uh, for, for this to work out in a positive way, not just so that, you know, I can make a big deal out of maybe something that's pretty minor. Psalm 37, refrain from anger and turn from wrath and do not fret, it leads only to evil. So again, avoid this, of losing control. Avoid anger, refrain from it and, and refrain from this whole idea of, of you know, trying to get even and, and trying to always win and always get my way. Refrain from that um, because... You know, sometimes people do things they shouldn't do, and certainly people say things they shouldn't say when they're upset. And, you know, he's saying just have a little bit more control than that when you're trying to deal with these situations. It, it's to one's honor to avoid strife. So again, it's not, hey, it does, does it seem like there's some people, it's like, like they're not really happy unless they're involved in some big, big thing going on. And if there seems to be too much peace, like they're the ones who are going to stir up the trouble. Like they somehow find a sense of meaning or purpose or enjoyment or fulfillment in being involved in all these battles and these struggles and these arguments, you know. So just say, I don't need to be involved in an argument, you know. In my mind, I can just say, well, that person is upset or that person's wrong or that person offended me a little bit. But I don't need to get involved with their issues, like, that's, that's on them. If, if they can grow through it, then that's up to them. But I don't need to get involved with everybody's uh, foolishness or everybody's uh, dirty laundry or whatever else is going on. I could just say, hey, I'm just going to avoid that. Um, but every fool is quick to cor quarrel. So some people just jump right in. And for whatever reason, I, I guess they, when people are like that, they have some kind of issue that maybe they've not dealt with. And maybe they're still trying to work through. But... You don't have to be involved in everyone's issues. Um, do not make friends with a hot-tempered person. So again, you're spending a lot of time with people that are always involved in conflict and fights and, and disputes, and, and they're just that kind of a hot-tempered person. Do not associate with one easily angered, or you may learn their ways and get yourself ensnared. So either you're going to become more and more like them, you learn from them, or you're going to get involved in all kinds of arguments. It's almost like being an accomplice to a crime. You know, it's like if you hang out with them, people are like, well, you know, you know, this guy, he's always that way. But, you know, his buddy, his buddy's Peter Morphy. So I guess Peter must be involved somehow. Maybe Peter's the one who kind of provokes him. Say, hey, you need to, you know, be my hitman when it comes to, you know, really putting people in their place. Right. And so I don't get angry. I'm just kind of inciting him to get angry or something. So. It's maybe better to avoid those kinds of situations. And if somebody's like that all the time, then uh, to, to avoid being with them and being involved in, in a lot of the things that they do. Well, in the New Testament, Ephesians chapter 4, in your anger do not sin. So again, he's saying there are times where, you know, you may be angry, but you don't have to sin in your anger. There is a righteous anger. 
quite often we have a hard time dealing with righteous anger because we're not always that righteous. Now we may say, I'm angry for a good cause. You know, I'm standing up for the helpless. It's like, well, kind of, but you're still, you know, you still got issues of your own that are unresolved. So it's hard for us always to see things clearly and in a godly perspective. But, you know, Jesus got angry when he was at the temple because the people were um, not allowing people to worship there. And he said, you've made uh, the, uh, God's house, which is a house of prayer, you made it a den of thieves, right? So he was not happy that they're desecrating the temple area for their own personal gain and taking advantage of people and really not even allowing some people to worship. So Jesus, righteous anger, and he's upset. And so he ended up, like you kind of look at him and go, wow, he's pretty mad. I mean, he's turning over. I mean, could you imagine someone coming in here today and somebody turning over some pews and, you know, um, burning some of our songbooks and um, where's our song leader? Oh, there's our song leader. I don't know what we do to our song leader. You know, we, <laughs> you know, just, you know, we get, we create a whip. You know, just, I don't know. We'd say, well, that's, per that's pretty extreme. But yeah, Jesus was really trying to show them that what they did was, was against God. They'd been doing it for so long, and yet um, they, they were despising God and dishonoring people, and you know, they were just making a, you know, a big show of, of, uh, of worship. And, and, and God was not happy with that, and certainly Jesus was not happy with that. But then he says, do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. So kind of deal with your anger, resolve your anger, settle your anger. Um, and do not give the devil a foothold. Again, the idea is if you let anger continue to stir in your soul, then Satan's going to be able to get in there and continue to work in your heart and maybe make you a very bitter and you know, upset person. And then, yeah, you may end up continue to say things and do things that are ungodly. And Satan's going to really be able to get in your life and, uh, and tear you down. So James 1 verse 19 says, My dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen. So it almost makes it sound like this is the opposite of being angry when we listen. So can we talk about this situation? Why are you feeling that way? Why did you say that? Why, you know, why are you so upset with me? Why, you know, and, and try to understand the other person's point of view. Sometimes we get angry at people because... They do something, but we don't always know what their motive is. Like if you, you know, I, I hear this sometimes in church that somebody will say, well, you know, I'm just not really happy today because so-and-so, they walked right by and didn't even say hi to me. And you think, wow, you know, um, that's a terrible person, didn't even say hi to you. Well, you know, the fact is maybe they were talking to three or four different people at the same time and they had somewhere they needed to go and they just passed by you and didn't say, they weren't necessarily mad at you, but you're angry at them and kind of imposing something on them that they didn't really mean to do. They, they, weren't, they weren't dissing you. You know what that means? I don't either. But that just means ignoring you or, you know, blowing you off or just, you know, saying, hey, you know, I don't want anything to do with you. I don't care about you. They weren't doing that. They were just maybe focused on something else. Maybe they had something on their mind, you know. So you, you can't be offended at everything people do. But, hey, if you need to talk it out, say, hey, you know, is everything okay? I noticed you didn't even you know, stop and talk today. It's like, oh yeah, well everything's okay. I just, you know, I explain it. They explain it. You go, oh, well that makes sense because I was pretty mad at you. I thought you didn't like me anymore, right? Well, sometimes when you talk to people, you find out what's going on and, you, and your anger's resolved. It's like, there's nothing there to be angry about. But I've only been angry like for three and a half weeks over that until I finally got to talk with them, right? So sometimes just listen, try to understand what's going on. Slow to speak, slow to become angry. And this is the important part, because man's anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. So our anger, again, is not making anything better. Like when you get angry at somebody, very seldom does it automatically resolve the problem, right? You know, so we say, hey, hey, Johnny, thanks so much for getting angry at me, because, you know, if you didn't get angry, I wouldn't have become a better person. I mean, how many people have ever thought that way? Now, when someone comes to you in love and tries to explain something and show you from God's word, tries to, you know, you know, if they start by saying, hey, you know, I really care about you and I love you, but, you know, there's just something that in your life that I've noticed and, you know, maybe it's something you can think about. You know, you take that a little bit easier than somebody who's yelling and screaming and, you know, flying off the handle. So you, you kind of have to understand the best way to communicate, and usually it's not through being out of control. 
All right, so um, Psalm 103. And so this is the end of, of this section. Just got one more quick section to go through. Not easily angered. Here's the thing. What is God like towards us? Because we offend him all the time. We sin against him all the time. We do things that we shouldn't. We don't do the things that we should. Sometimes we ignore him, right? So how is God towards us? The Lord is compassionate and gracious. Well, if he's that towards me, maybe I could be that towards somebody else without getting angry. See, God is slow to anger. He's abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. So if God's like that to us, then we should be able to be uh, forgiving and, and, and kind and patient with other people, even if they are doing things against us that they shouldn't do, uh, hopefully trying to work it out and trying to resolve the situation. So the next part is, uh, with this anger... Part of it is not keeping a record of wrongs. Because I think if we have a long record of everything that you've... Just a second, I've got a piece of paper here about how you all sin against me, you know, so I'll go through them all. And don't worry, like, there's only 35 pages of how you've hurt me over the years. Well, who's keeping a list? You know, who, 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 why would you do that? So this is kind of the idea. Now, it's not always written, but it's in our minds. It's like, yeah, I remember like five and a half years ago they said something, right? You're still holding on to that? Well, yeah, I'm not really sure if they were really sorry. Well, did you ever talk to them? No, I didn't really talk to them about it. It's like, so you think they're carrying that uh, around in their mind too? Uh, probably not. So it's just you, really. You're just carrying around this for five and a half years. And is that really helping you in your relationship with them? No, not really. Does that really help you in your relationship with other people? No, not really. Is that helping you in your relationship with God? Well, no, 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 not at all. But, you know, I like holding on to it, right? Maybe I can use it sometime. Like, use it for what? Well, if they do it again then I'll be able to say, listen here, mister. You know, you did this to me the other day, but I also remember that five and a half years ago, you did it to me a second time. Well, that's really helpful too, isn't it? Right? Keeping a list of everything that people do. So, again, depending on what translation you use, not resentful is from the ESV, or thinks no evil. That's the idea of it, dwelling on it and continuing to remember the evil, keeping it in your thoughts. Uh, the New American Standard does not take into account a wrong suffered. So again, it's kind of more of an accounting term where you're keeping a ledger, you know, just like somebody would with a book, your, your financials. You know, you keep a, a book and you write everything down. You know, here's some good things they did and here's the bad things they did. And, and you know, I, I got the record on you, right? So he's saying, well, don't do that. You don't have to keep record. You don't have to keep score. You don't have to figure out how you're better than everybody else. So the idea perhaps in this is maybe this list in 1 Corinthians 13, it's not uh, exclusive, and it's not inclusive. In other words, it doesn't include everything that love is or everything that love is not. But he is maybe addressing some of the problems that the Corinthians had so that they can understand, oh yeah, that's what we're going through. This is what we're dealing with. This is, this is the people in our church. This is how I'm feeling, right? So one of the problems was 1 Corinthians chapter 6, that people were taking each other to court, the court of the land. And so I'm going to sue you because you've harmed me, because you've defrauded me, because you've done something wrong against me. So I, I'm going to take you to small claims court. Right? So it's like, really? You're taking your brother to court? Is, is that really the best thing to do? Is that the way you've got to resolve your problems? So he's like, in fact, you have lawsuits among you. Uh, it, mean, it means you've been complete, completely defeated already. In other words, you're not getting it. It's not helping. You know, you're defeating yourself and you're defeating the whole point of the church. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? So why don't you uh, endure? Why don't you uh, absorb that injury and say, yeah, somebody's not treating me. What? Maybe they've slandered me. I could take them to court, but maybe I shouldn't. You know, maybe I've lent them some money. They never paid me back. Well, I could either for forgive it and forget it or else I can, you know, t take them to court and say, you know, they owe me the money. So he said, well... Maybe it would be better just to say, let's put that aside. Yeah, I've been wronged, but that's okay. I've wronged other people. They've forgiven me. I've wronged God. He forgave me. I can forgive somebody. Right? So, so maybe that's the idea. If we don't keep record of wrongs, then they don't keep coming up all the time. And so this is one example maybe where he says, the people in Corinth, maybe it was just uh, you know, a custom, the society way that people grew up saying, yeah, you keep a record of everything that people do to you. Again, Proverbs talks about this. A, pro a person's wisdom yields patience. It's to one's glory to overlook an offense. Think about that. It's to one's glory to overlook an offense. 
Not even, to, he's not even talking about recording it, but just saying, you know, they've offended me, but I'm going to overlook it. Now, by me telling you that I overlooked your offense towards me is not really overlooking it, but that's okay. But it's just within me to say, yeah, I don't need to pursue this. I don't need to make a big deal out of this. I don't need to remember this. You know, they did something. Maybe they made a mistake. So I'm just going to overlook it. That's, that's to a person's glory. That makes you a better person. So this, this, this is what the proverb writer says. It's to one's glory to overlook an offense. And so that certainly would include not, uh, not, not keeping a record. A fool, uh, fools show their annoyance at once, but the prudent overlook an insult. Right? So we don't have to get upset every time somebody may say something against us, but they're able to overlook it. Instead of making a, a deal out of it or causing a fight over it, I'm willing to overlook it. Uh, Proverbs 10, hatred stirs up conflict, but love covers over all wrongs. So that's the attitude of love, that I can forget it. I, I can put it aside. I don't have to always deal with all these things. Now, maybe there's a time where you do need to, to deal with it. It's kind of interesting in Jesus' life. There were times that he stood up and, and, and he, he did what was right. He was certainly concerned about justice. But you'd have a hard time finding any time when Jesus stood up for himself. Jesus was willing to stand up for others, right? If there, if there was some kind of uh, injustice that was going on, if there was something wrong at the temple, if people were, you know, the religious leaders were abusing the, you know, the, the people that were trying to worship God. And so, yeah, we've got a whole list of things that Jesus talks about, uh, for instance, in Matthew 23. But it's not because they did anything to him personally. It's either they've offended God or they're using their power to take advantage of people. But he's trying to stand up for what's right, not standing up for himself. Does that make sense? So sometimes we may stand up uh, for a principle, but you know, whenever there's harm done to us, generally, that's kind of where we say that Jesus would overlook the wrongs that were done to him. He was willing to forgive. Do not hate, this is Leviticus, do not hate a fellow Israelite in your heart. Rebuke your neighbor frankly so you will not share in their guilt. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge. So I think that's the part that's no record of wrongs. Bearing a grudge, carrying a grudge, keeping on, holding on to a grudge against anyone among your people. But love your neighbor as yourself. I'm the Lord. So again, it's kind of interesting because you know, we're, we're reminded Jesus asked, what's the greatest commandment? He says, first, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Where does that come from? Well, it's right here from Leviticus. But in the context of love your neighbor as yourself is be forgiving, be patient, and don't carry the grudges around. That's what it means to love your neighbor in the context. Love your neighbor as yourself is based on, you know, how do you love them when they've done things to hurt you or they've done things, uh, you know, against you? Then, then how do you react? So uh, we try to do the right thing and have the right attitude and not carry around all this, uh, this list of what's going on. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. Okay, so we've got a bitter root. To me, that, uh, that almost sounds like, that sounds like the grudge part. Because when you get angry, it comes out all at once. When you, when you keep a record of wrong, that's like a root. You've, you just planted a seed in your heart. Now, that takes time to grow. But as it grows, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. It gets stronger. It takes over, you know, maybe other parts of your heart and your mind and, you know, just the way you live and the stuff you're going through. So this bitter root is going to grow, but then what's going to do? It's going to cause trouble and defiles a lot of people, right? Because when I'm still carrying that grudge around, I start telling other people about it and say, you know what that person did, and you know what they said. This is what's going on. And so it just kind of gets out of hand, and it just kind of, we would say, pollutes or infects a lot of people with that kind of attitude that we have and that, this discord that we're sowing amongst the, the church. So 1 Peter 4 and verse 8, above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. So that sounds very similar to the verse we, we read in Proverbs a short while ago that this love covers over. 
the multitude of sins. So we don't have to continue carrying the sins in our own life, the sins we've committed. Certainly we don't need to be carrying the sins that other people have committed against us, that we're willing to, to say, love, love can cover it. You know, love is, is, is willing to, to forgive. And so this is kind of the idea that he's pointing towards in our life. Jeremiah 31 and verse 34 reminds us again, uh, this is kind of where we ended with the, uh, the first part about not being angry to realize that God is patient and kind with us. But again, if we're willing to think about how can we get to that point of, of not keeping this record of wrongs, well, God does not keep a record of wrongs with us. And so we want to have the same attitude towards others that God has. For I will forgive their wickedness, and God says, I will remember their sins no more. So God's not going to remember the sins. He's willing to put them away. He's willing to cover them over. And he sent Jesus that through Jesus our sins are covered over. And so that's the good news of the gospel. So another time it says, you know, as far as the east is from the west, so far that God has removed our sins from us. All right? Now, some people will say, but you know, sometimes when people really hurt you, uh, can you just forget about that? Can you forget about it? Well, you might not be able to forget about it. But the interesting thing is that you can live in such a way that you don't carry around all that burden and, and vengeance and trying to get even and trying to get mad and trying to sow discord. You know, you, you can be able to, uh, to, you know, we would say overlook it. In other words, it's not going to, infect or affect my life. Does that make sense? Because if somebody does a horrific t crime, like, like let's just say, you know, one of your loved ones dies from a drunk driver, right? Is anybody going to forget? You're going to forget that? Oh, you know, I, I even forgot that I had a child. Yeah, thanks for rem reminding me. Yeah, my child died a couple years ago of drunk, drunk driving. It's like, really? You forgot that you had a child that got killed by a drunk driver? So you didn't forget it, but you don't carry it around with all this, you know, the, the malice and the anger and the hatred and to the getting even and, you know, just telling people. And, you know, it, it doesn't always have to be the thing forefront in your mind all the time of this horrific thing that that terrible, sinful, wicked, evil person did. Was it bad? Yeah, it was. We're not trying to take away from the crime. But, you know, we're saying that it, it doesn't have to live in your heart. Because that's what God does for us. You'd have a hard time convincing me that God has forgotten your sin. Now, oh, it says right there, he's not going to remember our sins. I don't think that's what it means. Because what does God know? Everything? If God knows everything, does he know what you did yesterday and the day before? And before you became a Christian, does God know if you said, God, you know, he's like, what are you talking about? You never did that. It's like, well, yeah, I did. He's like, well, I've forgotten about it. I mean, that puts us in a place where we know more than God does. I know what I did. He doesn't. Well, I don't think I know more than God. So what is this saying? And maybe it's the same thing we would say about that person that's done something horrific in our life. Ken Shepard, I remember what you did in my life. But I'm going to treat you like it never happened. That's the power of forgiveness. That's what God does for us. He treats us as if it never happened. Because it's been forgiven. It, technically, it's been wiped off the books. But in his mind, he still knows what we've done. But he's willing to reconcile. And he's willing to put that behind. And he's not going to keep bringing it up. Like, heaven is not that kind of a place. David Priest, you remember in 1984? You remember what you did? That, that was just so bad, right? As a matter of fact, let's do a whole sermon on it in front of everybody in heaven. David Priest sin. And so, yeah, he's not going to do that. Because he's going to, it's, 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 it's out of his mind. It, 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 it's nothing that needs to be brought up again. And so he treats us as if we had never sinned. And that's the power of the cross. That's what salvation is all about. That's what God's done for us. And so again, the idea is, if he's done that for us, then we can do that for each other. So we always give an opportunity for those that, that maybe do have a, an awareness of sin in their life. Because if people don't have an awareness of the sin, they don't need a savior. Well, they do need one. They just would never realize it. They never, they'd never acknowledge it. 
Why would they need a savior if they don't recognize their sin? But maybe when people recognize their sin and realize, I've sinned against God. My, my, my relationship has been broken. And because God loved us so much, he sent Jesus into the world. That's kind of what we remember around the Lord's Supper. Jesus died for us that we could have life. We could be reconciled. We could have hope. We could have eternity with him in heaven. So God has provided a way of salvation for us. And so we always offer an opportunity if someone wants to become a Christian to surrender their life to Christ, to make him the Lord. We turn from our sins and, and we live for him. And if someone wants to be baptized into Christ so that their relationship can begin through the death and the burial and resurrection of Christ through the waters of baptism, uh, we always provide that opportunity. If we can encourage you or help you or pray with you, let's stand, we'll sing this song, and let us know how we can be a blessing.